And today there are no cures for most liver diseases. There's little hope for tomorrow unless more research is started now. The American Liver Foundation needs our help to find those answers through research. To learn how you can help, write Jack Lemon at the American Liver Foundation, Cedar Grove, New Jersey, 07009. From the nation's capital, the Mutual Broadcasting System presents the Peabody Award-winning Larry King Show, Network Radio's most listened to coast-to-coast -to -coast talk program, featuring guests from around the world and calls from all across America. And now, Larry King. Thank you, Fred Lowry, and good evening, everybody, on this Thursday night, Friday morning across the United States. This is the Larry King Show, coast-to-coast -coast on Mutual. I will tell you, as we go on the air... The calls are starting to come in, so I would suggest if you would like to talk to one of the great citizens of the earth, R. Buckminster Fuller, you might start calling in now. Area code 703-685-2177. On February 23rd of this year, Buckminster Fuller, or as he is known affectionately, Bucky, was awarded a Medal of Freedom by President Reagan. That is the highest honor this country pays uh, in awarding uh, concepts to non-military. Mr. Fuller has a new book, Grunch of Giants. It is, in fact, a follow-up to a previous work, and uh, Mr. Fuller makes some extraordinary statements in the book concerning uh, capitalism, the concept of our society, and where we go from here. If you are unfamiliar with him, may I quickly tell you that Buckminster Fuller is 88 years young, he remains the best-known American thinker alive. He is called the planet's friendly genius. He has gained renown as an inventor and designer of the Democian house, the Democian cat, the Democian map, the creator of the, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Getoscope Dome, the man who coined the term Spaceship Earth, organized the world game, a mathematician who discovered synergetics, and as a dogged individualist whose genius has been felt throughout the world, for over half a century. St. Martin's Press has published Grunch of Giants. Grunch, by the way, stands for Gross Universal Cash Heist. And the book is just published. It is his 24th published work. Tomorrow night we'll get a night off. Jim Bohannon will sit in. And Jim's guest will be Eleanor Holmes Norton, the former chairman of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I will tell you that all of our lines are going... And we will get to everybody in a while, and we welcome to our microphones Buckminster Fuller. How do you keep going at age 88? What keeps you going? I'm sure the reason I'm able to keep going is that people seem to care about what I'm doing. <laughs> and because I've discovered that humanity really has an option to make it on this planet, to, to, within a 10-year design revolution, we could have all humanity living at a higher standard of living than anybody's ever known on a sustainable basis, while phasing out all further use of fossil fuels and atomic energy. All this can be done through technology, employing the ever-advancing capability to do more for each pound of material, each erg of energy, and each second of time invested. Before we get to that, though, you personally, one could say that at age 88, you have the right to... Uh Watch the dancers. Drink the wine. I don't have any agents, booking agents, or any people doing it, soliciting on my behalf. All the engagements I have come through spontaneous invitations yeah, around the world. Why do you do them? And, and I go because I say, I think I have a function to let people know we really do have an opt opportunity to make it when this is not being advertised by any political systems and so forth. You're not, you're apolitical, aren't you? What, sir? You're apolitical. You, you don't call yourself, you're apolitical in the book you describe. I'm completely it. apolitical, yeah. yeah. By the way, for the benefit of residents of Washington, D.C., or if you are close to Washington, uh, Mr. Fuller will be speaking tomorrow night at the Shoreham Hotel here in Washington at 7.30. And if you would like information and like to attend, it is area code 202 628 
1577. You can call that number and get information. 202 628 1577. What is Grunch of Giants? Well, this is the great supernatural corporations of the, of the world. I found there was no collective name for giants, as there is a herd of horses. So I invented the name Grunch of Giants. And while you did read a, a takeout on what the letters could mean, I invented the word simply for great corporations. And those great corporations are the, what we call the Fortune 500, who uh, really own and operate the major industry of our planet. And you believe their intentions are evil? No, not at all. I'd say the, the intentions are, as far as corporations go, as a corporation lawyer will tell you, is to make money for the stockholders. The, uh, I would say that 99.99% of all the great executives of those corporations, you and I would like very much as human beings, they're very capable men. If they're interested, however, in doing things altruistically for human beings, the lawyers of the corporation say, I, I've got to remind you, you were elected to make money for our stockholders, not to be altruistic, so forth. It's very nice if you can be altruistic and do your work, but your job is to make money. All right, is that bad for us, those of us who live on the planet? Does that serve us poorly? I, I would say that this question, I don't, I don't use the word bad. <laughs> uh, it may actually be evolutionarily something very important because in the very big picture of evolution, humans were first distributed around the world remote from one another. They didn't know anything about each other. When I was born, it was still that way. Just before I was born, Kipling said, east is east and west is west and never the twain shall meet. And people thought that was a very practical statement. We didn't have any airplanes. We didn't have any radio. <laughs> we had no way of communicating. T today, with the transportation we have, all of humanity is being integrated. The United States is not a nation. Nations are groups of humans who have been isolated geographically for long periods of time, where those who survive under those particular geographical conditions have only others who also survived. They tend to concentrate the genes of the people who survived there. Russia had 148 nations to put together in the developing USSR, and they looked literally very different from one another, been isolated from so many. The United States is not a nation. We're the most advanced phase of crossbreeding world man. <laughs> so we are the beginnings of the giving up the ideas of nations and we're running our planet for everybody. Now, this means then great nations like the United States are going to have to go. <laughs> and they're, they're, especially the President of the United States, attaining his oath of office, agrees to look out, number one, for our sovereignty, <laughs> to protect it in every way. So he, will, he can't, if he ever talked about desovereignizing, they'd have to impeach him right away. Well. So you think it might be just an evolutionary phase? I, I think that these great corporations, which are organized up around the world, may become the organization we will use as the nations go out. All right, how we use it and where we go in a moment. My guest is the man that President Reagan, even though he is a critic in this book of the president, when the president gave him the Freedoms Award, he said, R. Buckminster Fuller is a true Renaissance man and one of the greatest minds of our times. He has made contributions as a geometrician, educator, architect, designer that are benchmarks of their accomplishments in their fields. Among his most notable inventions, discoveries are synergetic geometry, geodesic structures, and tensegrity structures. Tensegrity structures. Mr. Fuller reminds us all that America is a land of pioneers, a haven for innovative thinking, and the free expression of ideas. Buckminster Fuller received that award on February 23rd of this year. He is 88 years young. His new book is Grunch of Giants. We'll be back after these messages. Willie Nelson sings No Tomorrow in Sight. Available only from Hollywood Information Marketing. The superstar of country Willie Nelson with the album every fan and collector must have. No Tomorrow in Sight. Just $8.95 from Hollywood Information Marketing. 
Call 1-800-HIM-0004, 800-HIM-0004. Willie Nelson's album, No Tomorrow in Sight, is not available in record stores. 1-800-HIM-0004. In California, 213-856-0280. At International, we're going on by building the most cost-efficient, medium-duty trucks for every kind of job because we build them with a choice of efficient, mid-range diesel engines to match the job. We're building the trucks that today's economy demands, trucks that lower your cost of ownership, and that's a big reason why at International Harvester... We're going on! We're going on! I was a smoker for 25 years. My doctor recommended that I give up smoking, and I really wanted to. So I bought a packet of Bantron, started taking one tablet after meals, and after a few weeks, I stopped completely. Bantron smoking deterrent tablets help you break the cigarette habit. Clinical tests showed that as Bantron goes to work for you, the number of cigarettes smoked decreases. And the more you want to stop, the more Bantron helps. Use only as directed. It's been three months since I quit, and I don't need to start smoking again. I heard these two women talking on the bus about skin that's part oily and part dry, and how Cuticura soap helps, so I decided to try it. Cuticura medicated soap is designed especially for combination skin, skin that's part oily and part dry. Cuticura deep cleans oily areas to remove dirt and excess oil, and its rich, creamy emollients help condition dry patches so skin feels soft, smooth, and moisturized. Use only as directed. My skin looks and feels terrific. Cuticura medicated soap for combination skin. Again. From the nation's capital, you're listening to The Larry King Show. Once again, here's Larry. Our guest is one of the great minds of our times, R. Buckminster Fuller. Uh, I mentioned uh, for our listeners in the Northeast that he will speak at the Shoreham Hotel in Washington Friday night. He will also participate all day long Saturday from 10 a.m. on at Hunter College in their Integrity Day proceedings. I'll ask about that in a while. There have been two other Integrity Days in which he has participated, San Francisco and Los Angeles, and that will be all day long at Hunter College in New York City, all day Saturday, starting at 10 o'clock. Buckminster Fuller's newest book is Grunch of Giants. Now, a quote from this says, There's nothing in the United States Declaration of Independence which states or suggests that the United States is committed exclusively to the success of the rich. The United States, as we know it, is now bankrupt and extinct. Could you explain that? Well, when you get to uh, national debt of one and a third trillion dollars, and you're going behind every 200 billion every year, I'd say there's no possible hope of cleaning up that debt. I don't know whether, how much people really know about the national debt, but for instance, until World War I, there were very, very few times we had a national debt. When I was, when my boyhood days, we had no national debt. The national debt became something important after World War I. The cost of World War I left us with 30, 30 billion behind. But today we're up this extraordinary figure and going behind ever more rapidly, which would indicate that the United States is really, literally macro. There's no possibility, as I, I can see, we may get to the point when big money likes to make like armaments, because you, you make more money with armaments than the other game, and, and you do have the national government then, always the head of the government is charged, there's no one near enough in our world, so let's be sure we can protect our side. So we have the national defense continually building up a situation that quite clearly everybody knows about this, but at any rate, I say that the way that evolution is going to get rid of the nations, and particularly the United States, which is so big, is going to be by bankruptcy. So then at this point, I can see those, those big corporations taking over, because they're operating on a world basis. And we're, on, we're, we're now at a point where humanity is in a tiny little spaceship Earth, and we all know it. And we've got to really run that ship and the for everybody on board. And the multinationals might lead the yeah. running of that ship? They might be the runners of the ship? Yeah. The multinationals themselves? Uh, yeah. But they, they themselves are going to be run very much by the computer. You can't put untruth into a computer and get back truth. 
You, know, you only put into the computer what is actually really true. And a great many things we are operating on in big business that are no, no, not true at all. For instance, there are no deeds from God uh, to land. <laughs> we have great conquerors who took the land and said, anybody say this isn't mine? <laughs> and they couldn't, mm -hmm. nobody could say it. So these, then these great monarchs had exploration going. They always sent along priests who then, the, the uh, this monarch ordered the priests to say that God honored their claiming the land, but there's no such thing. Now, when you get to talking about owning the land, for instance, you can say, uh, all right, I, what, what, do you, what do you own here? I say, I, I own all this land, all, all the land below it. And I say, all right, is that, the people in China agree to that because the other has, uh, this <laughs> land is owned in China. <laughs> and I say, well, no, I, I mean just where we are here, I, I own my air rights here. I said, when you said that, this, the air that was here is all gone. It's going over, <laughs> over the Atlantic. He said, no, I mean this ge geometry here. I said, well, what stars were you looking at when you said that? Because those are revolving. <laughs> There's no way you can really own anything. So don't, don't you think, though, Bucky, that uh, back to defense, that we have to prepare in case enemies attack? I mean, isn't that? No, I don't have any such idea. Doesn't, don't have to. No. First place. We have the, Russia is being used as the uh, reason for having to have defense. Russia had its revolution in 1917. I was a young man then. I was in the United States Navy. And they had an old-fashioned revolution, which was for the people, uh, the serfs, to take over the land from the owners. Well, they did that, and then they found they didn't get anywhere. There's no way to get food to the people who are in the cities and so forth. Finally, Stalin very much to the dismay of the, of the Leninists and, and the Marxists, said you're going to have to have industrialization. They, they, the, the Leninists and Marxists didn't like that because they've been saying that industry was the same as capitalism. Now, industry is simply uh, using machinery. That's all that really means. At any rate, Stalin then went ahead with the five-year plans to acquire the technology that would be able to take care of all the millions of people. During the first three five-year plans, 18 million people died of starvation. They said they're going to keep on dying of starvation as we get this industry going. They assumed in World War II, they assumed when World War II was over, they'd be able to turn their industrialization on their people. No sooner was World War II over than they suddenly were told by the United States, the United States was getting ready a, a new th World War III, and, and Russia said, oh, you're going to fight, so they're going to fight you. You had to have an objective, but this had come about in the American economy at the time of the New Deal when the New Dealers realized America didn't like the word socialism. And they said, yet we're going to, we the people are going to have to take over the things that the economy stopped. What we'll do is to socialize the, the prime contractors of defense, which they did. And they gave U.S. Steel, for instance, approximately $100 million worth of new machinery at that time, which today would be well, way over a billion. And they gave them orders, getting ready for World War II. This is what Eisenhower discovered, what he called then the industrial military complex, who saw the economy, American economy didn't, couldn't go on without getting another war objective. Are you, are you saying then we are doing this as kind of a ploy? Yeah, that yeah. We are, we are building up arms not because they're going to attack, but just to keep industry and keep profits going? Keep the industry going? going, yes, sir. Well, isn't the Soviet Union to you at all a danger? Yeah, they're, they're, they're terribly concerned because it is now 50 years ago that they promised their people, if you go in for industrialization, we're going to give you a standard of living equal to the Western world. And they've never been able to turn it on. And they get more and more desperate. Don't and you fear them? Not at all. Why? Because I've been in many of the commissions back and forth between the United States and Russia, and I'm truly convinced of what I'm saying to you, that the Russians saw that they could not, they, they wanted disarmament so they could turn their industrialization on their people. And they were getting where they couldn't hold things together any longer if they didn't. And that, that is really a powerful condition there today. The, they said we're getting nowhere at disarmament with, with the United States. Every time we get to parity in the bombs, they introduce a new level. They said what we're going to do is to go back to conventional warfare. They had no navy at the time. Today they have three times the American navy, et cetera, and everybody knows those figures today. 
they've now built up such a capability with conventional arms uh, that they are out to enforce disarmament so they can turn their productivity and their people for no other reason whatsoever. I expect that, and, and I think that the, this is the very last session went on down there, Williamsburg, I would, I would guess that the leaders of the European states are beginning to realize what I'm saying to you is, is correct, and, and we will, we'll, if we get to making peace, peace with the Russians, then I have absolutely no fear of their wanting to enforce uh, any military things upon us. Do you think uh, all political systems as we know it will end? I think they're, yeah, I think they're all completely obsolete. All of them are, are pred predicated on a misassumption that was made at the time of the formation of the British Empire, which, as you may remember, Trafalgar was the first time, they said, this is the first nation in history where the sun never sets. Do you remember that mm -hmm. word? Sure. Expression. Right. It was a sphere. Up to this time, people thought of the Earth as a plane going to infinity, flat. We have all the exploration went on between the time of Magellan, when we found it was a sphere, there's 200 years up to Trafalgar, where all the people very ambitious to run the world now had great ships, and they sent them around the world and inventoried all the resources to be exploited, or they inventoried all the population rates and so forth. The, when the, after Trafalgar, the English set up, or rather the British, the, it was called the East India Company, which had been founded in 1600 by Queen Elizabeth, set up the East, Com East India Company College just northeast of London, and there they deposit all the research data that have been collected for 200 years on, on the resources of the Earth and where they are developed and tra trafficked in. Thomas Malthus was made professor of political economics of the East India Company College. He was the first human in history to have the total inventory of the vital statistics of a closed system planet. He then went to work studying it, and it took him five years before I wrote his first book about it, said quite clearly there's nowhere nearly enough to go around. The vast majority of humanity are going to have to go through life in great want and suffering. Pay all you want, won't do any good, he said, that's all there is. It's a sphere. It's a closed system. Thomas Malthus said at that time, the literacy of the world was below was about 1%. The people who could read Malthus were very few, and his information was really, what you call, highly classified amongst the people who were ambitious around the world. And so we don't hear about Malthus for about it's almost 60 years next we come to Darwin. And Darwin goes around the world and finds that there are no dragons, but there are all these different species. And he worked out his theory of, of evolution and said as a consequence of survival, only the fittest types and individuals within those types. Darwin is a contemporary of Karl Marx, who was at that time writing Das Capital. And we have the socialists then in England and else began to be elsewhere in Europe saying, Fittest survival only the fittest. The workers, the fittest to survive, because know how to handle the tools and plant the seeds, and these other people are parasites. Let me hold you right there. My guest is R. Buckminster Fuller. He's one of the world's great thinkers. He's author of a new book, Grunch of Giants, Grunch standing for Gross Universal Cash Heist. It is published by St. Martin's Press. It is written as a myth, but no fairy tale. We'll be back on the Mutual Broadcasting System your network for news and sports. Big business, small business, make it your business to support the Guard and Reserve. There are people who work for you and the rest of us too. They're in the Guard and Reserve. Your support they deserve because they give up their time. So come on, stand behind. Of the USA. Hi, folks, this is Tom T. Hall. Now, employees who serve in the National Guard and Reserves are volunteering their time, their skills, and their energy to protect you, your business, our whole country. They need your support and your encouragement. Let them know you're proud of them. Send them off to serve with a cheer and welcome them back like the true patriots they are. Big business, small business, make it your business to support the Brought to you as a public service by the Committee for Employer Support and the Advertising Council.